All right, as you all know, Zojo has been free to use since its release in 2013. This makes Zojo easy, easily accessible to anyone in education and has resulted in a notable rise in Zojo classroom usage. In particular, Regis University of Colorado has recently introduced Zojo into their curriculum to great success. Here to briefly talk about this is Dr. Ed Lindu, a professor at Regis University's College of Computer and Information Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lindu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure you flip the switch on that. Good. You did? You hear me okay? Yeah, it's working? Good. Perfect. So let me give you a little background on myself. I think it might help kind of understand what's, what we ended up doing here. Um, actually, last year, late last year, I published a paper on this, and I'll be getting into a lot more of that here in a few minutes. But <clears throat> on myself, um, I was in IT for 37 years um, at a newspaper, several newspapers, um, starting at the ground up from a programmer, working my way up to senior IT director. And throughout all that time, I kept dabbling in programming. Some of the stuff that I had built many years ago, I had to continue to support it because nobody else wanted to do it. Um, so even as an IT director, I was still messing around. But um, if we go back to um, 19, hello, oh, I guess I'll just hit the button. <laughs> I thought you loved live demos. Sweet, I'm frozen. There we go. Whew. 1977, okay, here I am, five years out of high school, right? And uh, working as a wonderful Radio Shack manager. Remember those, those Radio Shack stories? They were great. I think I was making like $3.33 an hour, working about 70 hour weeks. And it was late 77 and Radio Shack made an announcement that this little guy was coming out. And I was like, man, I gotta have one of these. So, but I didn't have the money for this. It was, they were kind of expensive. Anybody ever have one of these, standing one? A few of you? Okay. <clears throat> well, I had the first one in Florida, and the way that I was able to do it, because I was a Radio Shack manager, I uh, put a few dollars down on it, and I ordered it for the store as a customer, and I put it on layaway. So, you know, I could have it in my store, as long as it didn't go out, it was on layaway. I had it out, set it out on the counter, and we were in an industrial park, we're near an industrial park, where there was a number of high-tech companies around back then. Motorola was one of them. And so their Motorola programmers would come in and they were just falling all over this thing. You know. And uh, I started programming in DOS and I knew nothing about it. <clears throat> and some of the programmers would come in and they'd give me some pamphlets they had on DOS or they'd show me how to do things. And finally I ended up writing a program, or several of them in here, that I actually used in the Radio Shack store to track some of our inventory. And that was you know, kind of neat, but one of the things that you notice here is that little cassette player next door, right? This thing had no storage. It had no floppy disks. It had no hard drive. It was just nothing. So when you wrote a DOS program and you got it all done, you're like, okay, I got to save this. I want to save my work. You had to save it off the cassette, right? Bring it back from cassette the next day when you wanted to reload it. It was a real pain. Um, somewhere along the line, I think around 1992 or 82, I bought a uh, Sanyo computer and it had a couple of floppy disks in it. I thought, man, I'm set now. And eventually I upgraded that thing to uh, a 100 meg hard drive. And I swore I thought that was going to be the last hard drive I would ever need, 100 megs. <laughs> Today this thing has 500 terabytes in it, right? I mean 500 gigabytes. So yeah, it's, uh, and, and I'm almost full on this thing. So <clears throat> anyway, around 1985, I was in this, working for this weekly newspaper. And I saw that the thing was kind of going south. I felt like it wasn't going to last much longer. I'd been there about six, seven years, and I said to my wife, I said, you know, I got to do something. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been doing all my own thing with programming, but I want to go out and get a job as a programmer. Well, the only thing I knew was DOS at that point from playing around on the com other computers I had. I said, you know, I think I need to go to college. So here I am, 13 years out of high school, never went to college, scared to death to go to college. I got a family to take care of, a wife and kid. But I did it. My first class was a COBOL class. And I, I mean, I was really scared. But you know what, I, I took the class and I came out with an A. And that just got me so motivated, getting that A. So I took more and more and more. Well, right about the time that I took, I ended this course, 
guess what happened? The um, weekly newspaper I was working for, day after Christmas, closed up. So the first thing I did, I got in my car and I drove down here to the Miami Herald, which was just right down the street here, like two blocks away, gone now. Um, and I applied for a job there. And I turned around, I went up to Fort Lauderdale and I applied for a job at the Sun Sentinel. Never heard from the Herald, but the Sun Sentinel called me. And they were interested in me because I had done a lot of ad layout with the weekly newspaper, just manually, you know, drawing boxes page by page by page where the ads are going to go on. Also, I did some classified work, classified pay stub, and I had one class of COBOL behind me. So they were interested because they had a lot of COBOL in their systems at that point. This was 1986. <clears throat> and they were just putting in a brand new um, ad layout system, and they wanted me to be in charge of doing this. I was like, man, this is great. So I was hired. Well, I kept going to community college, and I took Fortran, and I took RGB. And these were requirements, not that I wanted to take it, but you know. Um, Pascal and Assembler, and about the time that I finished the Assembler there, my boss tapped me on the shoulder and she goes, hey, you know, our uh, ATEX classified quote programmer, quote was the, the program that quoted all the classified ads, and I mean, we ran hundreds of thousands of ads every week, and every ad had to be quoted, and every, had a, every ad had a different rate. You know, real estate ads rated differently than car ads rated differently than pet ads and for sale and whatever. So there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tables that you had to go through all these rates. Well, I said, sure, I'll take this over, but uh, you know, you, I gotta, you gotta send me to Boston to get, because this is very specific training for this. So they did, and I, and I spent four weeks up there. And I supported that system for about 15 years. This is the big PDP 1134s, right? Anybody remember those? They're basically like the size of a, a, a standard computer room rack today, you know, the ones you have all your servers in. Well, these were, each unit was in its own rack that size, 12 of them. And uh, had the old wash tubs, remember the old brown uh, 300 megabyte? I won't get into that, but it was pretty nasty stuff, especially when those things crashed. Uh, so then I took uh, QBasic in uh, college and uh, a little bit of ADA, and then I got into real basic, not in college, but we had a need at work for an interface, and Real Basic was available, a friend of mine showed it to me, I wrote an interface in that, and we ran that sucker for about 10 years, I think, um, and it hooked into our ATEX classified system, so into the PDP 1134, it, we interfaced to it. Uh, and then I got involved in Zojo recently, and somewhere along the line, through all this, and between work and college and everything else, I ended up doing something in all this stuff. So. Do I consider myself an expert? No, but I've been around enough, and my boss knows all this, and that's why I think they asked me to get into what I was doing. Uh, a couple interesting stats I just wanted to throw out here to make sure you're all awake this morning. Um, how many Google uh, searches do you think go on every second of the day? Any guesses? A lot, right? It's actually about 63,000 per second. That's about 5.8 billion per day. That's a lot of stuff going on, right? Uh, and it, so that's all built on Java, Python, and C++ backend. Let me ask you another question. Um, what language performs 85% of all the ATM transactions today? Any guesses? Yep, COBOL. Most people don't believe that, but how many transactions do you think they do every day, every second? Probably less than Google, right? I mean, Google's big. How about 1.1 million per second? <laughs> 95 billion per day. So maybe someday Zojo will get some numbers like this. You never know. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's pretty incredible stuff. I think I wanted to throw this out there just to kind of maybe get you guys thinking a little bit. Uh, because I, I wrote a paper on this. And if you go to lindu.com and look up papers, you'll see it. Um, there's actually a, a phenomenon going on now because there's so much COBOL still out there in the world, believe it or not, that all these COBOL programmers are retiring. Well, they're dying or retiring. And there's a big need now for it. And, and every time I look out there on Indeed or whatever, Monster, it's going up and up and up, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the demand for it. Um, so my point is, is that, you know, Zojo's great. And if you know Zojo, it's really not that hard to learn COBOL. It's, it's a very easy language like, like Zojo Basic. So if you, um, 
if you're in need of a job, that's uh, there's some good money on that stuff, and it's going to be around a while. So, okay, now we don't want to move again. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> at Regis University, you think of a university as um, a big place, right? And it is. But a lot of people don't realize that within a university, you have a lot of different colleges. You have the College of Business, the College of Finance or Accounting, uh, maybe a, a um, medical college. And then within our college structure, we have distinct uh, colleges, computer science and computer information systems. Computer science is, you know, more of the, I don't want to say geeky, but kind of the hardcore head down programming, banging out kind of guys, right? The other side, the information systems is more of the um, data analytics, ERP systems, supply chain, um, IT management, um, IT project management, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> we had a little bit of a problem. Um, we looked at a three-year average, and we found that 50% or we had a 50 plus percent drop rate in intro to programming classes. So what does that mean? Well, something's going on. And we took a look at it, and here's the graph on it, which I won't dwell on. As you can see along the bottom, CIS versus CS, and, uh, and the high numbers there. The higher numbers are the uh, CIS, computer information systems that were failing. <clears throat> and so the, um, it's a big problem, as I said. Because if they fail this course, what happens? Well, they don't go on in the program. The program consists of about 12 to 15 courses, amounts to probably around 30,000 of revenue per student for the school. If they drop, we lose the revenue. Uh, so it's, it is, represents a big loss of revenue. <clears throat> so I took a look at it, and I found that what was happening was the computer science department was teaching the two programs that were required, it's required by both schools, but um, for ours, they were teaching our, you know, our, our information system students, they were teaching them the two intro programs. One is intro to programming, the other is uh, Java. S teachers have a flexibility to kind of teach what they want. So I <laughs> found that in the intro to programming class, some of them were teaching straight Java right out the box. Some were teaching C++, and they're like slamming their fist on the desk if they can't get through my C++, they don't need to be in programming. <laughs> Come on, you know, we're talking about an intro class, you know? So anyway, um, and, so, and so as I mentioned, what was going on was that um, we had the computer science students intermixed with the uh, computer information system students. And not that that's really a problem, but the CIS students, they don't really have the strong technical skills. They don't really have the strong desire to you know, heads down, crunch out programming. They just sort of want to move through that and get into what they really want to get into, which is supply chain management or data analytics or that kind of stuff. But they do need to have a little background in it. So we certainly don't want to start them out in a C++ course um, as an intro class. But that's what was happening. So I was asked by the dean to fix it. Well, I had to do some research. And I did quite a bit of it, and I, I was specifically looking for research on why students fail, specifically intro to computer classes, and I found a lot of stuff out there. And after sifting through it all, I decided to go back to the basics, basic programming. That's why I called this paper Back to the Basics. So I started thinking back to my days of basic and QPASIC when I took all this stuff in uh, college. Um, and I remembered, you know, basic. Well, you guys remember the old basic stuff? Line numbers, right? This is a really good example of a bad program. I mean, here you got line numbers 1, 10, 11, 12, 13. If you want to insert something, forget it. You can't, you know, there's just no way. And I highlighted the yellow part there. Remember the go-to statements? And that was probably the biggest downfall of basic, is that they gave you the freedom to go anywhere you wanted. So if you had programs that were going up and down and all over the place, and nobody could follow anything. So we quickly got away from basic. And I knew that wasn't going to work, so I, or I should say I knew that wasn't going to cut it. So I did a little more research, and I found a common theme. And the common theme was that all these researchers that had written all these articles said that visual programming environment was the way to go. It really keeps everybody, you know, it's, it's intuitive, it keeps their attention, it keeps them excited about it. And so I decided I need to go look for a visual um, 
programming environment. So I thought long and hard about it, and uh, even though I'd done a lot of work in BB.net, a lot of it, um, but I just felt like, you know, it's a, first of all, you gotta pay for it, it's not cheap, and even at a student rate, it's still dollars they have to lay out. And uh, I just thought it was a little bit too heavy for what I wanted to do just for an intro to class. So then I remembered back to my days of Real Basic, and I thought, you know, that'd be pretty decent. It, it worked nice. And I went looking for it, but I didn't find it. I found Zojo instead, <laughs> right? So I said, wow, let me, let me try this. So I, I played around with it a bit, and I said, man, this is great. You know, and I met with Paul last year, and um, it was wonderful. So I rewrote the entire course, um, Intro to Programming, in, um, in Zojo. Ah, but there's a catch. Isn't there always a catch? See, <laughs> no matter what you do, there's always a catch in life. And the catch is, is that once they graduate the intro class, I gotta get them through a Java class, right? So it was a, it was a two part whammy on me. So I thought about that and I said, well, what if we did two languages at the same time? What if I show them, you know, here's how it works in Zojo, and here's how you do it in Java, and then I'll give them an assignment. Here's a Zojo assignment, here's a Java assignment, or vice versa, right? And so that's what we did. So comparing and contrasting Zojo with Java. And if you look at it, it's a lot of the stuff is really, you know, here's basic on the left and Java on the right. It's uh, really very similar. Just make sure you put the semicolons at the end of the Java statements. And of course, when you're actually programming, you got all those little squirrely brackets in Java you got to worry about that you don't have to worry about in Zojo. But other than that, a lot of it's the same kind of stuff. So we did it, and it worked out well. Um, in fact, I, f I did a little more research, and I found a paper uh, titled A Multilingual and Comparative Approach to Teaching Introductory Computer Programming. And this is exactly what they talked about, teaching multiple languages at the same time. And they got into all kinds of great stuff about how um, for example, um, immigrant uh, children learn two languages better than you know, one and trying to learn another one later, that kind of thing. So it was an inter interesting paper. So perfect, just what I was looking for. So it made a lot of sense to me, and that's what we did. And we introduced the new course last fall, and we had some interesting results. It was a dramatic turnaround. So what were those results? Well, the student pass rate went from 38% to 85%. It's a pretty big turnaround. But if you think about it, 15% uh, who failed, they never showed up for the class. <laughs> so I know it's funny, but you, it's, and I just don't get it. People sign up for a course, right? They never log in. They never do anything, not even a comment on the bulletin boards. And but they get counted in my numbers. So for me, I consider it 100% success. And then it gets even better because everybody who took, um, actually there's two courses they've taken now, everyone who has taken those two courses in Intro to Programming with Zojo has, ah, yes, they went on to pass the Java class. So that's a big improvement because the, the drop fail rate or the pass-fail rate in the Java class was 47% prior to this. So now we've kicked that up to 100%. So. <laughs> Thanks. So I would really love to get more and more universities interested in this. Um, I would love to get it to the point where, like, uh, for example, SAP has a university alliance. They're huge. I mean, they got I, probably over a thousand schools that are in alliance with them. Uh, maybe we won't get that big, but I would, you know, I think this would be really wonderful for a lot of universities to use something like this. Um, so I'm trying to find anybody here that might be in a university. Come see me later. Uh, but thank you, Zojo. Thank you for an easy, intuitive visual environment. I think that was very important that um, we have that. Uh, thank you for the free 14 chapter manual. We use the heck out of it. Thank you for an easy to learn language, basic, works great. Thank you for a platform that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. We have a lot of students that run Mac or Windows. Not too many Linux people, but fine. I'd like to leave you with one parting thought.
Any questions? Comments? Sure. I haven't done it yet because I haven't had anybody ask for it. Um, did did y'all hear the question? Have I packaged this up so that other universities could use this? Um, and the answer is no because nobody's asked for it. I'm not really going to take the time to do it unless I get the, you know, somebody wants it. I'd be happy to do it. Um, I did ask Dana last year to give me a list of all, or yeah, to get a list of all the universities that you, use Zojo. And she said, well, I can't give you the list, but I can send out to those people, which she did. And I had one person contact me, because uh, I kind of wanted to start like a little user group of Zojo University folks. But, so if you know of anybody um, that might be in a university environment, let me know. I've got a follow-up. Yeah. How well does this thing the same course that works at my Oh, I think it worked great. I mean, it's, let's face it, it's pretty easy. Right. Hmm? Hmm? Well, I have all the materials. It wouldn't take long to put it together. Um, yeah, we should talk about it. In fact, I got to talk to you later today. Yeah, and it's kind of on that topic. So, any other questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, That's a good question. What's the biggest re the biggest reason why a university wouldn't teach Zojo? Um, I guess off the top of my head, I would have to say because you have. In the universities, you have a lot of diehard instructors out there that um, are just hell bent on C++ or Python, and they don't want to know about anything else. Um, and so it, it's tough getting over that hurdle, right? When you have drop fail rates like we were having, um, something had to be done. And you should see what's happening now at the university. Remember, we have the two different departments. Mine is doing gangbusters, like 100%. They're still down in the 40% pass rate computer science. Well, they're in the dean's office now just about every week trying to explain how they're going to fix it. They don't want to go my route because they don't want to admit they're not doing too well. But I think they're eventually going to have to come around to something, you know. But ultimately, I think most uh, universities today are trying to get students to a point of learning, at least in the computer science anyway. Well, everybody should, has to know job. I think no matter what side of the wall you're on, computer science, information systems, even some folks that are like in uh, healthcare have to learn Java. Um, that's just a requirement. But then when you get further on, you know, like in computer science, they got to learn Python and C++ and whatever. So, um, but I think you know, for an intro class, this is great. At the high school level, man, this would be perfect. And if you could get this out into a lot of high schools, you know, because that's just the next step to getting them into college and and the, and the tougher stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We never, you know, went, well, I, I dated myself already, but you know, back when I was in high school, we didn't have programming. I mean, not, not even heard of. Luckily, I took a typing course and I was able to get into, uh, I was, actually did typesetting for the newspaper. If I had done that, I wouldn't even got that far. All right, anyone else? Okay, thank you.